All right, we got the recording going again. So you have 77.55 grams of xenon. How many moles of xenon is that? 0 0.5. And then if we have 22.45 grams of uh, fluorine, how many moles of fluorine is that? Oh, seven. It's the same number with zinc yeah. right? And we get there by just using the atomic mass like we've been practicing. We have 22.45 grams of fluorine and every 19, 18.998. Yeah. One mole. Fluorine should get something about 1.2. 1.1. So what's the formula of the compound? Is that enough to answer the question? It's, I mean, if you're if you're mathematically minded and you see where this is going, you can, might be able to look at this and see what that ratio is. If you want to actually show the work, say, okay, well, whatever I have the fewest moles of, I'm going to assume the coefficient for that one's going to be one. Or not the coefficient, sorry, the uh, subscript. Mm -hmm. So then if we say, okay, if I have one for every one mole of xenon, how many moles of fluorine is that? Yeah, 1.182 moles of fluorine over 0 0.5907 moles of xenon. Gives the number really close to two even, right? Yeah. Probably actually all the way out maybe 1.999 or something like that, but really close to two. So then what's our formula? This is the way that they used to determine the formula for compounds before they had modern techniques. You would just, you would run an analysis and see how many grams of of one element you had and compare it to how many grams of another element and then look at their molar ratio. Right, and this is actually what this week's lab is going to be as well. You guys are going to do what's called a gravimetric analysis where you start with a compound and then you put it through a couple of reactions and weigh the products out to figure out how many moles of everything you started with. Aria? How do we decide that you not goes first? Um, it goes from least electronegative to most okay. electronegative. So when in doubt, in when fluorines involve fluorines, always the least electronegative yeah. or the most electronegative, right? So xenon has to go first. That said, if you wrote F two X E, people would look at you funny, but still gets the point across what the what the formula is, right? So then, how do we figure out the hybridization? Or the or the geometry. Yeah, we use Lewis dot structure. What is Lewis dot structure going to look like here? In the Xenon in the middle. We had 14 plus another 8, 22 electrons to work with, right? Yep. We just used... We just used four of them, so now we're 18 electrons left. Give the fluorine what it needs. Now we're down to six electrons left. Where are they going to go? On the xenon. You can't go on the fluorine, so they have to go on the xenon. What's the formal charge for the xenon in the middle? 
How many electrons does it own? Six that it owns outright, plus one more from each of the bonds, right? Yeah. Total of eight. And how many does it have on the periodic table? Zero. Eight. It has zero vacancies. Zero. So formal charge of zero, yeah. Which is why this is a stable compound. Because it, even though xenon was already at a formal charge of zero, xenon was already stable, it's also relatively stable like this. And this also makes the fluorine more stable than having fluorine attached to itself. So what's the hybridization for the xenon? Or no, five. five electron domains. So we need to mix five pieces of orbitals together. SP3 D. That's five pieces. Don't forget that S counts as well, right? Which means this should have what electron geometry? Same as the one we just did, right? Trigonal bipyramidal. All right. That's about where we're going to leave hybridization for now. We're going to talk about some easier conceptual stuff for a bit now. Any questions before we move away from this? Is this kind of making sense, even though it doesn't make sense necessarily why you would need to do this? Connor? Is the SP3D the hybridization of the xenon or the whole thing? The xenon. Okay. So let me, let me put the structure back up here. Every atom is going to have its own hybridization. So what's the hybridization on the fluorines here? The fluorine has three electron groups or four electron groups around it, right? So every fluorine, each of these fluorines has an sp3. And the xenon is sp3d. Lila and then Arya. Um, so when you're naming the hybridization of molecules, just the xenon. That's usually the one we're asking about. I'll try to be specific, but usually we're talking about just like with the electron geometry. These, the fluorines also have their own electron geometry. But since we can't see three out of the four pieces, it just looks like the fluorines are at the end, are linear, basically yeah. at the end of the line. Um, but their electron geometry would still be tetrahedral. So, but yeah, so when I'm asking about it though, when in doubt, just say for the middle or just be specific. The elect the hybridization for the xenon is sp3d. All right. I was gonna ask. Okay. All right. Let's talk a little bit more about reaction types. Um, we talked a little bit about precipitation reactions the other day, so we're going to talk about them a little bit in a little bit more detail now. Um, what happens when you add salt to water? Sodium chloride. You get salt water, right? Do this. Does the solid sodium chloride? Sodium ions and the chloride ions are pretty, pretty strongly attracted to each other, right? So why would they, what does it actually look like when you put them into water? Do they stay stuck together? No. Why not? They dissolve. It's not a solid anymore. We can write it as NaCl aqueous, but is it is it really still present as NaCl? Because NaCl is that big, that whole big crystal structure. Oh, no. We really get the pieces floating around, surrounded by water molecules. When we have ionic compounds dissolved in water, we really get Na plus aqueous floating around, surrounded by water molecules, and Cl minus chloride ions floating around, surrounded by water molecules. 
So when we have these, these ionic solutions, why is it not? Um, when they separate out like that, we can actually show that this is the case because it turns out water doesn't conduct electricity very well. But that doesn't seem really match with what you've heard in everyday life, right? Turns out in order for water to conduct electricity, you have to be able to move charges around. Electricity only passes through material where you can freely move electrons or charges around. So pure water, deionized water, doesn't conduct electricity. It only conducts electricity once you add what are called electrolytes. And an electrolyte is anything that has these charges. Any ions that are dissolved in a liquid are going to make that liquid conductive, which is why they're called electrolytes, is because it allows electricity to pass through that material. Right, and so most ionic compounds that will dissolve in water are what are called strong electrolytes. And a strong electrolyte just means that 100% of the time or close to 100% of the time, when you add these ionic compounds to water, they split up into their individual pieces. There are some electrolytes that are called weak electrolytes where they still split up, but they don't split up 100% of the time. So acetic acid is an example of that. What's the formula for acetate? CH3CO2 or C2H3O2 with a minus charge, right? I'd say I also grade, finished grading your polyatomic ions quiz last night. Um, Y'all need more work with that too. So I'm going to keep quizzing you on your polyatomic ions. So if this is acetate. What's the formula for acetic acid? Just stick an H in front of it, right? And this is exactly why we don't usually combine these hydrogens. We have acetate, and then we have the hydrogen that makes it acidic. When you put, if we have uh, acetic acid as a pure liquid, and we add it to water, we get, what are the two ions that you could form from that? I'll give you a hint. One of them we just named. You're thinking about it too much. Just acetate, right? Remember that these acids, even though they have their own naming structure, they basically are ionic compounds, just where hydrogen is the positive ion. So when I say what, what ions can you get from an acid, it's always just going to be whatever the anion is. And you get H plus is floating around. We can we'll refine this definition a little bit. But what the point I'm trying to make right here is that this, even though we draw it, we can draw it with a reaction arrow, it doesn't happen 100% of the time. This is our first example of what we call an equilibrium reaction, meaning it doesn't happen 100% to completion it actually reaches a point where the reverse reaction is happening at the same rate as the forward reaction. When that happens, it looks like nothing's really changing. Right? And so for this reason, we call acetic acid is considered a, a weak electrolyte because it doesn't split up 100% of the time into its ions. Right? And there's a lot of different organic compounds in particular, but a lot of different compounds where even though they'll dissolve in water, they don't split up into their pieces 100% of the time, right? And that's our definition in chemistry of strong versus weak. Strong always means it happens 100% of the time. And weak is always going to mean that there's some back and forth that it stops short of 100%, right? And that's, one of the big topics we have left to cover in this class is how do we know how far does it go? How do we how can we predict if it's not going to go to 100% splitting up? How do we predict how far does it go? Um, and that that whole concept is called equilibrium. 
And I'm just trying to prep you with the concept so it doesn't seem like it's out of left field. For now, we're gonna treat everything that has a reaction arrow like this, like we've been doing, we're gonna treat it like it happens 100% of the time when it comes to our stoichiometry and our math. Right, and then I'll teach you how to do the math, do the equilibrium part later. What happens to your salt water if you keep adding salt? It gets more salty. Can you do that infinitely? What happens eventually? Let's say I've got a pot of water and I've got 72 boxes of salt. Can I dissolve all of that salt in the water? There's not enough water to go around. What do you call that type of solution when you reach the point where you can't dissolve anymore? Overflow? It would probably overflow depending on how big the pot was, right? That's called a saturated solution. Saturated just means you've got to a point where you can't dissolve anymore. All right, so saturated. Just means you've gotten, and it really is an equilibrium process, just like the acetic acid example I just showed. When you get, when you get to a certain point, this reaction stops happening because the reverse reaction starts happening at the same speed. The reverse reaction would just like, would just look like a salt ion or a sodium ion runs into a chloride ion and forms salt again. So, and this is what's called this idea that it's basically, it's not, the reaction's not stopping. It's just happening the same pace forward and backwards. Um, let's say I got my paycheck at the end of the month, uh, and I had a certain balance in my checking account. And at the beginning of the next month, I had the same balance in my checking account. Would you assume that I just didn't spend anything? Or would you assume that there's no net change because the amount that I spent was the same as the amount that I got paid? The second one makes more sense, right? In terms of everyday experience. Just because it looks like if you take snapshots and it looks like there's no difference doesn't mean nothing's happening. It can mean that there's no net change. And that's what these equilibrium reactions are. And we can prove this. If you take a saturated salt water solution, you can uh, and then take one big salt crystal and put it into a saturated solution. If it just doesn't dissolve, We'd, we'd expect that salt crystal to stay as one big crystal, right? But what we actually see, if you come back an hour later, is that that salt crystal is gone, and now you have an even coating of salt across the bottom of your, your container. Because the salt crystal started was still doing the forward reaction, you just also had the reverse reaction happening at the same rate. So your, your amount of sodium chloride that you had dissolved stayed the same, even though we still had changes happening. They're just changes at the microscopic level. The macroscopic viewpoint is that nothing changed. All right, and so if you took that one big salt crystal and you put it into a saturated solution, you would eventually wind up with something like this. You get a layer of salt kind of sludge across the bottom all right and then the other type of electrolyte we can have is what's called a non-electrolyte the non-electrolyte is something you can dissolve in water but doesn't make it so it can conduct electricity so basically a non-electrolyte is a covalent compound for the most part if you have a covalent compound that'll dissolve in water it's still all going to hold together as one piece. So ethanol, for instance, is CH3, CH2OH. If you have that as a liquid and you add it to water, we'd still get a solution, CH3, CH2OH. But there's no individual ions in ethanol 
It's a covalent compound, which means it doesn't break apart into individual ions like our ionic compounds do. Which means when it dissolves, it stays as an individual molecule. Which means adding ethanol to water doesn't make it more conductive. It's a non-electrolyte because when you dissolve it in water, it stays all as one piece. These are one of these con concepts that winds up being important a lot in biology and biochemistry. Where have you heard the term electrolytes before? Gatorade. 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 Rondo, it's got what plants crave. If you haven't, if that sounded like gibberish to you, you should watch Idiocracy. Um, because it talks a lot about electrolytes and how electrolytes are what, what plants crave. Electrolytes are what you crave. Salt tablets are trying to add electrolytes as well. So basically, there's a, a point where salt is not help, healthy for you, but you need a certain level of salt in your body. Salt, sodium ions in particular, are responsible for sending nerve signals from your brain to your muscles. Um, you need the right ratio of sodium ions to potassium ions. That's, that is the mechanism by which electrical signals pass from your brain to your muscles. Um, if you drink pure water with no electrolytes in it, what happens is your brainstem lo loses the ability to communicate with your muscles, including your heart and your lungs. Um, so you can actually, drinking pure water with no electrolytes in it actually can kill you. What is that called? Is that called like ionized water? Uh, so distilled water, deionized water, reverse osmosis water. Um, you don't want to drink any of that stuff. Because it can throw off your electrolyte balance in your in your body. What if you drink a gallon of it? Like, what would be constant? So even even just regular tap water. If you drink too much regular tap water without um, eating anything, it can cause issues. Marathon runners um, that don't drink something like Gatorade or Pedialyte while they're going through the marathon can get to a point where they have too much water and not enough ions in their blood, um, in their nervous system. And that's actually one of the things, we, if you've ever seen recordings or YouTube videos or something of uh, people finishing the Ironman triathlon, there's like their muscles actually still have energy, but they just basically lose the ability to walk. They start staggering like they're drunk. It's called ataxia. Um, and it happens basically because your brainstem is not communicating with your muscles anymore and you just eventually collapse. Um, it also used to happen in the, in the 90s. Um, when there was a big push against um, underage drinking or or students on colleges drinking, um, a lot of the frats started having water drinking hazing, where they would force people to drink water the way they would use, they used to do it with beer, um, and they wound up killing people doing that as well. Um, so I, in particular, I think Chico had a couple of incidents where some of the frats at Chico were like, "Oh, we're not gonna we're not gonna encourage drinking alcohol anymore." We're just going to haze these freshmen by making them drink water. And one of them eventually died because they had too much water in their system and their parts in their, their lungs stopped working. So um, electrolytes are an important thing. They're not purely marketing, but they're a lot marketing these days because if you're eating like anything, you're getting enough salt in your diet just from whatever you're eating. Um, no, it'll actually sting more, but you take the deionized water for a safe for a uh, nasal rinse, and yeah. then you add, um, you make it a buffered solution by adding a little bit of salt and a little bit of baking soda to it. Um, it but you want to start from deionized water because you don't know what's in your tap water right. otherwise. Right. Um, and so, and if you ever actually do try to do a flush with DI water, it actually stings really, really bad. Or it's, it's like getting pure water in your eyes versus salt water, salt water, saline in your eyes. If you've ever you know, used warm contacts or anything, you can barely tell it's there, but pure water actually hurts your eyes. Um, so it's basically pure water is not as big of an issue for most of the world as contaminated water. But for those of us that live in places where we can go buy distilled water from the grocery store, don't start drinking distilled water because it's bad for you too.
Um, it also tastes really bad anyway. So before anybody taught me this, I worked in a chemistry lab and I'm like, oh, I'm going to get some of the DI water. I'm going to drink this. It's the good stuff. But it tastes really bad anyway. Um, most bottled water, even if it's purified using um, distillation techniques, they go back and add ions to it because, other, because otherwise it tastes bad and it's bad for you. It's, it's a little bit difficult to describe. It's kind of like if you can picture regular tap water tasting flat, which sounds like a contradiction because it's already flat, but it's like, it has like an absence of a taste. It's weird. Is it like a safe amount? Or is it just like you could, drink any of it once for you? No, I'm standing here. I mean, I'm yeah. just telling you that I drank it, so. Um, don't do it on a regular basis. It's not going to hurt you to, if you, they sell it by the gallon at Rayleigh's for, for like humidifiers and stuff like that. Um, mineral content is 100% why different water from different places, different tap water from different places tastes bad. Um, our water up here has almost nothing dissolved in it. It has some ions dissolved in it, but not very much, mostly magnesium and calcium a little bit of sulfate and a little bit of chloride um but different places like in in la or in big cities where they've had to reprocess the water and then go back and add more ions to it they that process of purifying it makes it safe to drink but it doesn't make it pleasant to drink so um, like that why drinking water here feels more like refreshing part of it's what you grow up grow up with but yes it also most people would agree that it tastes the water up here tastes better out of the top um, but it also depends a little bit on what you grew up with. My, my wife's family in Northern Minnesota has well water and it's, it's yeah. got a lot of stuff dissolved in. It still tastes pretty good, but it doesn't taste like our water. Um, because it has, it's passed through an aquifer and picked up lots of ions along the way. Um, but it still tastes way better than getting tap water out of the city. All right. So here's. This one's kind of a fun practice with solubility. So basically how much solubility is how much can you dissolve of something before you get to that saturation point? And it turns out um, sucrose, table sugar, you can dissolve about 2000 grams of table sugar per liter of water. So in other words, so 2000 grams is about five pounds. You can dissolve about five pounds of water in one or five pounds of sugar in one liter of water. It's a li that's actually that's what maple syrup is. It's just a saturated sugar solution with some flavoring. Um, so what's the molarity of that? How do we figure out the molarity of that solution? It's in grams per liter. We want it in moles per liter. We remember how to do that, right? If we have the formula for sucrose, it's not too tricky, right? It's it's a big molecule, but that doesn't change the process, right? So 12 carbons plus 22 hydrogens plus 11 oxygens. You get 360 minus 18, which is 342.297. So just because it has a big formula, it doesn't mean that anything is tricky about this, right? We're dealing with bigger numbers. Grams of sucrose for every 342 grams of sucrose, 342.297 grams is one mole. So get something. 
All right. So you actually can make your own maple syrup or simple syrup until you add maple flavoring to it. Um, does anybody know, anybody done any cooking, know how to make simple syrup from scratch? Water and sugar. Mix water and sugar and cook it. Basically, it's usually by volume, it's about one, one to one. So one for every one liter of water, you add one liter of sugar, which winds up being about 2,000 grams. So that's all simple syrup is, is just a saturated solution of, of sugar and water. Um, and if you add flavoring to that, you get other types of syrup. Miles? So that's the traditional way. That's the real way. If you buy, if you buy this stuff um, in the plastic container with the red lid, Rayleigh's, it's just water they've added sugar to with a little bit of maple flavoring added at the end. You buy the stuff that comes in the glass bottle with the little circle handle that's so small that you can't really use it for anything. Um, those, that's real maple syrup where it means they took maple sap and they boil it down until they get to this concentration of sugar. And which point, if you continue to boil off more water, you can't get any more sugar to dissolve. So you actually wind up with little, if you've ever had homemade maple syrup from scratch, it usually has little sugar crystals that look like rock candy sitting at the bottom of it. Because that means it was boiled a little bit too far. So, but it tastes good. Um, my in-laws in Northern Minnesota also do that. Uh, in addition to having well water, they make their own maple syrup because why wouldn't you? It tastes delicious. And if you've got a whole bunch of maple trees and you live in a place where you can, they call it mapling, um, where you can maple them, then why wouldn't you? Does anybody know what the conditions have to be in order to get maple sap? Cold. It has to be cold, but not too cold. You have to have a tree. And then literally you drill a hole into the tree and you stick a tap in it. And it drips into a bucket. It drips into a bucket and you collect the sap and you boil it down. You don't add anything to it? Nope. It's just, just boil it down. Oh, it has to be it has to be below freezing at night and above freezing during the day for the sap to flow. If it's any warmer than that, then you don't get any, then the sap doesn't taste good. And if it's any colder than that, then the sap doesn't move and it doesn't collect. So we can maybe do that sometimes in Tahoe. We can do that in Tahoe if we have maple trees to grow here. If you plant maple trees, you can make your own. It takes a lot. So my in-laws will collect about 30 gallons of sap and it'll turn and turn it into about a gallon and a half of maple syrup. Um, it's about a five to one ratio um, if everything goes well. It's a lot of sugar, it turns out. Um, and actually in other places where there's less, where maples don't naturally grow, you can do this with other deciduous trees. Birch sap is actually used. You can make birch syrup. What about probably, you could probably do aspen, no guarantees it would taste good though, but we could try it. You can just drink the sap. It's actually good for you. It's what Native Americans used to do before the Europeans got here and said, oh, this tastes really good. Let's boil it down so we can make it more concentrated. That was basically just so they could ship it. Um, they did this the same reason why has anybody learned in AP or in US history about the um the corn whiskey rebellion? Yeah. Corn whiskey rebellion, the reason it wasn't because they loved their whiskey so much, it was because that was the only way they could actually transport their crop efficiently and make money from it. And so it was to take it and process it and turn it into something else. That's why you had the sugar trade in the Caribbean. It's why you have maple syrup. It was all about how do we get it from here to market. Um, and in the, at least the legend is that's also where IPAs came from. The beer, India Pale Ale, gets its name because they would ship it from the UK to India in a concentrated form. And they were supposed to dilute it back with water when, once it got there to make it regular pale ale. Anyway, the history of uh, why we have a lot of these products is fascinating to me as well. Um, all right. So point to where we're trying to get here before we keep getting distracted about this stuff is when we have these, it's, it is called the golden rain experiment. Um, see if it'll open. 
if you mix hey everyone, today's video if you make you can make two colorless ionic solutions um made up of is it potassium and uh lead nitrate potassium iodide and lead nitrate and you get these two colorless solutions and when you mix them you get this yellow solid forming it doesn't look very solid at this point camera focus got out of Two it's just one solid for me. Solid. But you start from two colorless clear solutions. See if when you and when you get a, a bigger, it does look like lit. This is why it's called the golden rain experiment. You can take these things. This is what also why alchemists were like thought of as magicians back in the medieval era, because you could take these two things and make something appear out of nothing. And it looks really fancy and shiny, especially if you're in the, in the Middle Ages and everything looks kind of like grimy and dirty all the time. Look at this, I can take these two solutions and I can make make gold from them. So I think he actually purifies it later. And you run it through some coffee filters and you get something that looks like that. It's not actually gold though. It's actually lead iodide. Oh, okay. But it's really pretty. And again, if this is back in the middle ages and nobody has any idea what's going on at the microscopic level, it looks like you just created gold from nothing, right? So what's actually happening here? What's really happening here is a precipitation reaction. When we have these two colorless solutions, we have lead nitrate, which when it's dissolved in water is really lead two ions floating around and nitrates floating around. And when we add that to potassium uh, iodide, well, potassium iodide solution is potassium ions floating around and iodide ions floating around. When we mix two ionic solutions together, if we make new combinations of these ions, not everything is gonna have the same level of solubility in water. Not everything will stay dissolved, basically. So all that happens in a precipitation reaction is if we happen to make some combination of ions that doesn't dissolve in water, it forms a solid. And it looks like we made the solid out of nothing. They call it a precipitation reaction, precipitation from the same root as precipitation in the upper atmosphere. In the upper atmosphere, precipitation looks like we're forming water vapor out of nothing. Is it really out of nothing? No. What is the water vapor forming into clouds and snowflakes in the upper atmosphere? Where's that water coming from? The ground, and then it evaporates and is sitting in the gas form in the upper atmosphere. And then when it gets cold, it turns into solid or liquid floating around, right? That's basically what's happening here as well, except that it's, it's all contingent on, do we make some combination that won't stay dissolved? All right, so if I write out the entire reaction for you, it's pretty easy to see. If you start with two ionic aqueous solutions and you turn it, one of them into a solid, that's a precipitation reaction. And what, what happens to the rest of the ions? So the lead and the iodide formed into a solid. What happened to the potassium and the nitrate? They stayed dissolved, right? They stayed the same. So basically with these, with these um, precipitation reactions, you're almost always going to form one solid and then you're going to have your the remaining ions are just sort of floating around. So they're still aqueous. The potassium nitrate is aqueous and those ions are still just floating around. So what if I asked you to predict a precipitation reaction? Well, it was, it, 
being able to predict what's going to happen relies a lot on knowing what dissolves and what doesn't. And that sounds like memorization, right? And other than polyatomic ions and element names, I'm not big on memorization. So I'm not going to make you memorize what dissolves and what doesn't. What you'll get instead is a solubility table or a, a list of what we call solubility rules. And solubility rules just give you a shorthand for predicting what's going to stay dissolved and what will turn into a solid when we mix them together. So for instance, if it says group one is soluble, group one is column one on the periodic table. It says group one is soluble, which means it's not going to form a solid no matter what. There are no exceptions. The only exception to that rule is lithium phosphate. Uh, and actually, do I have a better version? So here's another way of viewing it. This is a solubility table. If you look at these group one sections, see how they say soluble the whole way down. Basically what this means, sodium, sodium compounds will dissolve in water, period. There's no exceptions. There's no combination of sodium ion with something else that'll cause it to form into a solid. On the other hand, if you have something that says insoluble, like magnesium two plus and hydroxide ion, when you mix those together, they don't stay dissolved anymore. It's insoluble. That means when you mix those two together, you'll get, you're going to form a solid. You're going to form a precipitate. So if we had something like magnesium chloride and sodium hydroxide, well, magnesium chloride, we can make a solution with that because magnesium chloride, if we look on our list here, magnesium and chloride says soluble, right? So we can make a solution out of magnesium chloride and sodium hydroxide. If we check our chart, it also will dissolve just fine. If we mix these two solutions together, though, we get two new combinations. We get sodium and chloride and magnesium and hydroxide. Sodium and chloride, is that soluble in water? What is sodium chloride? Salt. Salt dissolves in water, right? So sodium and the chloride will stay aqueous. They'll stay dissolved. But the magnesium and hydroxide, that's on our list of things that are insoluble, which means if you mix magnesium ions and hydroxide ions together, you're going to get magnesium hydroxide as a solid. All right, so this is a more detailed chart. Usually you see solubility rules looking like something like this. All right, so, and we can use these tables to predict what will happen. So if we have sodium nitrate and potassium chloride, if we put sodium nitrate and potassium chloride together, do we make anything that's going to show up as a solid? It's... Nitrates are soluble, no exceptions. Group one is soluble, except for lithium phosphate. Sodium and potassium are both group one. Nitrates are soluble, no exceptions. Chlorides are soluble, except for silver, lead, copper, and mercury. So since we don't have any of those there, we wind up with our two new possible combinations are still soluble in water which basically just means that nothing happens. We started with, and it can be helpful that when, to understand what's going on here, to start by separating these out into the ionic forms. We can have sodium aqueous plus nitrate aqueous plus potassium ions aqueous plus chlorides aqueous. We have all four of these mixed together. 
there is no combination we can make that's insoluble. All of the combinations we can make of our positive ions and negative ions are going to stay dissolved. And if they stay dissolved, does it actually look like anything happened when we mix these solutions together? No. So in this case, we actually would just say no reaction. If we mix these ionic solutions together and nothing changes, nothing changes, no reaction. What about sodium chloride and mercury one acetate? We have sodium ions plus chloride ions plus it's written a little bit funny. Mercury one ions stick together in this weird shape. Um, but they still each individually have a plus one charge. And acetate. Do we make any combination that's going to form a solid? What is it? We know that sodium chloride dissolves because it starts aqueous. And we know that mercury and acetate dissolves because it starts as aqueous. So then we need, we need to look at, okay, does sodium and acetate, are they going to form a combination that forms a solid? Will sodium ever be part of a solid in one of these reactions? Group one are soluble. The only exception is lithium phosphate. So it's not gonna be the sodium. Acetates are also soluble. It, with the only exception is, is silver ions. Chlorates, chlorides are soluble, except for silver, lead two, copper one, or mercury one. So mercury chloride is going to be a solid. The other ions are still just going to be floating around. Okay. Mercury is a tricky example because mercury one sticks together like this. So it, the charges look funny. The main thing is reading the solubility rules. You're just looking at what combination of ions you can make now. And if any of them are insoluble, then they form into a solid. They don't stay dissolved anymore. All right. Last one, the third one, ammonium sulfate and strontium chloride. Do we make anything that's going to turn into a solid? What are our products going to be? Ammonium is soluble, no exceptions. Strontium is nowhere on here really, but sulfates are. Sulfates are soluble except for silver, lead two, barium two, strontium two. So we're going to make strontium chloride as a solid. All right, so writing out the answers for these, we're going to make strontium sulfate as a solid, and then we still have the ammonium and the chloride floating around as aqueous. So this last one, ammonium chloride and silver nitrate. We'll make silver chloride in ammonium nitrate. This actually, this last one, since we have, I don't know, 30 seconds left, that last one actually is a, of particular historical interest. Anybody know where this reaction shows up historically? Silver chloride is actually the dye that's used in the oldest forms of, of uh, black and white photography. Silver nitrate and ammonium chloride would stick to 
to the film that was exposed to light in certain places. And then when you expose it to the developing solution was basically allowing the precipitation reaction to happen. You would start with your silver nitrate, your silver nitrate would stick to the paper and then you would douse it with something that had chloride and that chloride would stick to the silver and make a black dot basically. So if you do any black and white photography, is there photography classes here? Do you yeah. make photography still? You guys develop your own stuff? Uh, it's mostly, not, it's all mostly digital now. I was old enough, I'm old enough that they still develop their own stuff when I was in high school. And they still used um, silver chloride when they were first learning about All right, more practice with this on Wednesday and we'll do a pre-lab for lab as well. Tomorrow, finish up your assignments. Get everything turned in, please. Yeah, a good question. Yeah. For precipitation in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's already oxygen.